special A9 TV interview with Professor Michio Kaku, co-founder of String Field Theory. Michio Kaku, the famous scientist of Japanese ancestry, is a theoretical physicist born in the United States of America. One of the most prominent physicists of recent times, Professor Kaku has written many books and has appeared in countless radio and television programs. Michio Kaku is known for his contribution to the popularization of science and has researched such subjects as black holes and the expansion of the universe. He is also one of the founders of string field theory, one of the basic models of physics. Let's, go, uh, let's ask a question about the dreams. Mm -hmm. So the dream world and the real world. Right. How do we feel the hardness, see the colors, feel the temperature of matter in our dreams although they don't exist, and what is the difference with this so-called real life? Using brain scans, we see what the person is doing when they dream. When you are awake, your occipital lobe back here responds to visual stimuli from the eyeball. When you dream, that same area of the brain lights up. So the brain is creating fictional images in the occipital lobe back here. Okay. Can you be sure that there is matter outside of our brain? For example, I touch this microphone. Okay, how can I be sure that there is a microphone outside of my brain? Because I touch it, I see it, I hear it, everything in my brain with signals, right. electric signals. There is a philosophy called solipsism. And the question is, if a tree falls in a forest, did the tree really fall at all if no one's there? So the solipsist would say that the world is a dream, that we exist in a dream, and that we don't know whether things really fall or not. Now we have the quantum theory, which is even more bizarre than solipsism. The quantum theory says that before you look at a tree, the tree can be upright, fallen, toothpicks, burnt, a house, or anything you want. When you look at it, it turns into a tree. In quantum theory, the Bohr interpretation says that the, op the process of observing something determines its existence, which is worse than solipsism. So then the question is, <clears throat> Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat is one of the deepest of all paradoxes in all of science. If I put a cat in a box, is the cat dead or alive? In quantum mechanics, we take the wave function of a dead cat and then we add it to the wave function of a live cat. So the cat is neither dead nor alive. It's in between. So how do you know if a cat's dead or alive? You open up the box. But that requires an observation. Observation requires consciousness. So consciousness, in some sense, determined existence. Did you watch the movie Matrix? Yes. And what are you thinking about its philosophy? I think that as a philosophy and as a science, we will be able to create a world almost like the matrix. So we can use the brain directly to control objects around us. That's today. What we cannot do is input memories into the brain. We cannot do that yet. There was a question in that movie. Uh, he was asking, if you are dreaming and you cannot wake up, how can you be sure that you are dreaming or you are not? Well, you can't. Mm -hmm. You are saying that the brain is like a computer, it's a supercomputer, but it consists of uh, meat. Mm -hmm. It's How wetware it rather than hardware. Yes. How is it possible that it became flesh? Well, if we were to take transistors and model the brain, neuron for neuron, we can calculate how big that computer would be. That computer would be the size of a small city. It would consume about a thousand megawatts of electrical energy. That's the output of a nuclear power plant. It's very hot, too, because it generates electricity. You would take a river to cool it down. So if I have a small city, a computer the size of a small city, water coming in from a river, and a power plant, a nuclear power plant energizing this gigantic computer, that's the brain. But our brain does not generate a thousand megawatts, it generates 20 watts, 20 watts. It's not the size of a city, it's this big. How is that possible? Because first of all, the brain is not a computer. We used to think the brain was a computer, but now we know that it's not. There's no windows, 
There's no Pentium chip. There's no programming. There's no windows. There's no subroutines. Nothing. So how does the brain work? The brain is a learning machine. It rewires itself after learning every task. So that's how the brain does things that even a digital computer cannot do. Digital computers cannot learn. Your laptop today is just as stupid as it was yesterday. Just as stupid as it was the day before yesterday. Your laptop never gets smarter. But your brain, that's all it does. All it does is it learns new tasks. That's why the brain is really not a computer. The wiring is different. And that's why it takes a, a city, a computer the size of a city, to act like a brain. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Is there any